أمال كوموريت وفالو حيدوخ عاشو البانيبان حلمونو لومالكو ومرقيتي نبو أماردوك نبارخي أمالكو ومرقيتي In the sprawling city of Nineveh, around 685 BC, the Assyrian royal family welcomed a new member, Ashurbanipal. Being born into the world's most powerful family, a childhood of safety and privilege awaited him. Yet, by age four, he would be on the run, escaping with his family from Nineveh's great walls, a place that should have been his sanctuary. The seeds of this escape were sown years earlier. More precisely, when the Elamites kidnapped Ashurbanibal's uncle, Ashur Nadin Shumi. Ashurbanibal's grandfather, King Sennacherib, called upon the formidable Assyrian army and marched to Elam to get his beloved son back. But the Elamites executed Ashur Nadin Shumi, and Sennacherib had to appoint a new son to be his successor. Tradition dictated that the king's oldest living son should be the heir. But Sennacherib defied this norm. He bypassed his elder sons and named Ashurbanibal's father, Isarhaddon, the new crown prince. A decision that had unforeseen consequences. Ashurbanibal's uncles openly showed their frustration. And as tensions escalated, Sennacherib sent Isarhaddon, along with his immediate family, away from Nineveh. But the storm was inevitable. Sennacherib was betrayed and murdered by his own sons. The news of Sennacherib's brutal death echoed throughout the ancient world, leaving Esarhaddon with guilt and grief. Could he have prevented his father's death had he stayed in Nineveh? The past didn't matter now and Isarhaddon was forced to make a daunting decision. Remain in exile with his wife and children, or abandon them to avenge his father. Although history only leaves us with Isarhaddon's decision, it must have been a hard one for him to make. He must have kissed his wife and children, promised them that he would be victorious while masking his uncertainty, swear that they would soon reunite while knowing he could be away for months. And Ashurbanibal, at the tender age of four, must have been old enough to shed tears of confusion and longing when his father departed. Isar had not rallied those still loyal to him and marched to Nineveh. With the help of his mother, Nakia, Isar had not won the civil war after six dreadful weeks. Ashurbanibal's uncles fled north to Urartu and were never seen again. And so, young Ashurbanibal, still too innocent to grasp the magnitude of the events, returned to Nineveh with his family, unaware that his teenage years and adult life would be filled with similar events of dread, death and despair. With time, things returned to normal in Nineveh. And within the palace walls, young Ashurbanibal grew up amidst the laughter and squabbles of his many siblings. He was surrounded by three elder brothers, an elder sister and at least ten younger siblings. The eldest, Sin Nadin Apli, was destined for the throne. Yet it was Shamashum Ukin with whom Ashurbanibal shared a complex bond. They often engaged in board games where luck was the most important factor to win. Something Ashurbanibal seemed to have more of than his older brother. And whenever Ashurbanibal won, he'd mock his brother, who ran after him. Until Sin Nadin Apli, or their sister, Sherua Etera, stopped the commotion. Yet beneath the surface, Ashurbanibal held a soft spot for Shama Shomukin, and referred to him as his favorite brother. Then there was Shamash Metu Ubalit, the third eldest brother. His name, translating to Shamash has brought life to the dead, hints at a life marked by illness from birth. His relationship with Ashurbanibal remains a mystery. 
The palace in Nineveh, home to about 15 lively children, was constantly filled with the sounds of youthful cries, laughter and little feet running through its vast corridors. The only time the kids might have been quiet was when Ashurbanibal's grandmother, Nakia, was around. Although Ashurbanibal's mother was the queen, it was his grandmother he feared the most, and so did his other siblings and the rest of the empire. Whenever Isarhaddon was home in Nineveh, he was seen with Nakia more than anyone else. She was the only one the king could truly trust. And except for Isarhaddon, Nakia was more powerful than any man or woman in the Assyrian Empire. Ashurbanibal barely saw his father. The king was constantly leading the Assyrian army on war campaigns. And when he was back home in Nineveh, he was busy with appointments, administrative tasks and other duties. But Isarhaddon still loved his children and made plans for each of them. His plan for Ashurbanibal was to become a priest. Since a priest had to be fluent in Akkadian and Sumerian, Isarhaddon assigned Ashurbanibal a private teacher, the best scribe in his palace, Balasi. Balasi took his job with uttermost seriosity, but he couldn't have asked for a better student. Ashurbanibal showed great cognitive skills as a kid. He quickly learned to read and write cuneiform. Just learning one cuneiform language could take years. Ashurbanibal learned too. But apart from scribal arts, Ashurbanibal was talented in mathematics too. He loved solving complex mathematical problems. And in general, he was interested in anything that would expand his knowledge. And Balasi kept polishing the diamond he found in Ashurbanibal. The two of them would form a lifelong friendship. When Ashurbanibal was 11 years old, he experienced another family tragedy. This time, it was his older brother, Sinadin Apli, who died unexpectedly. And history repeated itself. Just as Ashurbanibal's grandfather, Sennacherib, lost his firstborn son and crown prince, Ashurbanibal's father had to go through the same misfortune. After grieving over the loss, Isarhaddon had to choose a new heir to the throne. He knew that Ashurbanibal was a great candidate. Balasi had kept reporting on the boy's progress, and Isarhaddon certainly saw something unique with him too. But nobody knew better than Isarhaddon what could happen if he overlooked his oldest living son, Shamashum Ukin, as crown prince. When Isarhaddon was to appoint the new crown prince of Assyria, his health was deteriorating. The disease that had haunted him for most of his adult life had worsened. None of his specialists could heal him, neither could they diagnose the illness. The king could go days without eating and was deeply depressed. He was always paranoid, fearing the gods' wrath and questioning what he might have done to receive this life. A murdered father, a dead son, and a sick body and soul. But nonetheless, Isarhaddon's health made it evident that he had to choose a new crown prince. The king sought advice from his mother, Nakia, as he had done many times before. Nakia affirmed that Ashurbanibal was her favorite grandson and preferred crown prince. But she knew that if Shamashum Ukin gathered support and revolted, a civil war could break out. It was barely 10 years ago when it happened between Isarhaddon and his brothers. Eventually, Isarhaddon and Nakia came up with an unconventional idea. Both brothers would be kings, as equals. Ashurbanibal would rule Assyria, and Shamashum Ukin would rule Babylonia. Thus, they completely overruled Ashurbanibal's second oldest brother, Shamash Metu Ubalit. The reason was likely that he, just like his father, suffered from illness and disease. But there was another problem with this master plan. Ashurbanibal and Shamashum Ukin could never be equals. The king who ruled Assyria was by definition also ruling Babylonia. And even if that wasn't the case, Babylonia was still a tiny piece of land in the vast ocean that comprised the Assyrian Empire. Ashurbanibal knew this, Shamashum Ukin knew this, and every citizen in Assyria and beyond knew this. 
Isarhaddon and Nakia weren't stupid. They knew this too. But formally declaring the brothers as equals and making Shamashum Ukin king of Babylon was intended to reduce the risk of civil war. At least that's what they believed. Isarhaddon quickly changed Ashurbanipal's educational path from priest to king. Since Ashurbanipal could read and write, he got to be a spy master. Isarhaddon introduced Ashurbanipal to the network of spies in his empire and told him to send him written reports. This gave Ashurbanipal invaluable experience in the affairs and political landscape of Assyria. One year later, when Ashurbanipal was 14, his father marched against Egypt again. Ashurbanipal had to stay home, but he continuously received reports from his father's scribes who traveled with the army. The first time Isarhaddon had gone to Egypt, he was defeated and withdrew. But this time, he was victorious. The news reached Ashurbanipal like wildfire. Egypt belonged to Assyria for the first time in history and Ashurbanipal's future empire was the largest the world had ever seen. Shortly after Isarhaddon's conquest of Egypt, the Assyrian Empire was struck with a crisis. News of a prophecy linked with the moon god Sin foretold that the seed of Sennacherib, Ashurbanipal's grandfather, would be destroyed. Behind this prophecy was a man called Sasi. He was a distant member of the royal family, allegedly a descendant of Ashurbanipal's great-grandfather, Sargon II. Sasi was planning to usurp the throne from Isarhaddon, and his plot gained momentum. He gathered support from all corners of the empire, and before long he had infiltrated Isarhaddon's inner circle. Even Ashur Nasir, one of Isarhaddon's most trusted advisors changed sides to support Sasi. Isarhaddon wasn't surprised that trusted advisors and governors betrayed him. His own brothers had done that. But Isarhaddon wasn't expecting the number of supporters Sasi gathered. Sasi's influence grew day by day. The situation turned so severe that Isarhaddon had a substitute king take his crown while he went into hiding. But Isarhaddon didn't stick his head in the sand. Instead, away from the spotlight, he worked day and night, gathering information about the plot. Probably with the help of his spy master, Ashurbanipal, and other loyal people throughout his empire. After three months of hiding, Isarhaddon had mapped most of the plotters. And when no one expected it, he struck like a wind from Enlil. Isarhaddon massacred the plotters throughout his empire, Sasi included. It was a large-scale mass execution. Isarhaddon even destroyed buildings where the plotters had been meeting. He then tightened the security even further, and Ashurbanipal had learned one of his greatest lessons so far. One year later, at the age of 15, Ashurbanipal managed the whole empire's intelligence network. This was a big step for the future king, whose support from his father was undeniable. But Ashurbanipal's education as future king also led him to physical activities. He was taught to drive chariots, ride horses, and fire arrows on horseback. With these skills under his belt, Ashurbanipal learned how to hunt lions. While hunting animals was a widespread activity in Assyria, Hunting lions was only for royals, and it was an activity the future king would return to throughout his life. But being crown prince also came with other duties. Ashurbanipal had to marry his future queen. He chose a woman named Libali Sharat. Nothing is known about her background, but she wasn't born with the name Libali Sharat, since the word Sharat basically means queen. The wedding was likely arranged but the couple's affection for each other indicates that there was love behind the marriage too. But not all were happy with Libali Sharat's entry into the royal family. Ashurbanipal's sister, Sharua Eterat, wrote this letter to her new sister-in-law. Kai 
dlosti anošek dmi, hathe jo jhothod šerua i tirat. I bartho rapho du kusrod esar haddun, malko du athrod ašur. Hath i kalo, u jathtod ašur bani bal. U amiro ravo du malko du kusrod esar haddun, malko du athrod ašur. If Sharua et Tarot was jealous, or actually thought that Libali Sharot would bring shame to the royal family for being illiterate, is not obvious. But Libali Sharot eventually learned to read and write, and in a stele she had erected and composed, she noted that Ashurbanibal was her beloved husband. Ashurbanibal reciprocated her affection and had his queen depicted on reliefs in his future palace, a rare thing for Assyrian kings to do. Isar had on kept giving authority to his sons, Ashurbanibal and Shamashum Uke. And when he embarked on another trip to Egypt to suppress a rebellion, he left his sons to rule his empire. But on the 1st of November, 669 BC, the king suddenly died at age 44. Although Isar Haddon was sick, he was healthy enough to take the long road to Egypt. So when Ashurbanibal received the message of his father's death, it came as a shock that gripped him with sorrow, but also fear. No matter how much Ashurbanibal had trained for his future role as king of the world's largest empire, he was still only 16. But luckily for him, he had his grandmother Nakia behind his back. Nakia had lived with and supported three of Assyria's prior kings. Her father-in-law, King Sargon II, her husband, King Sennacherib, and her son. King Isarhaddon. She wouldn't let anything or anyone stand in the way of extending the royal legacy to Ashurbanibal. But with the events of Sasi fresh in mind and the civil war between Isarhaddon and his brothers only a decade away, Nakia had to act fast. Upon Isarhaddon's death, Nakia wrote a treaty that she spread across every corner of the Assyrian Empire. <laughs> I kashtud ashur banibal. Kfurdo alu amo du athrod ashur. Me derbed ashur banibal. Unbreida umnakio. Idat shemaitu memlo bisho. Dik misem fahu al ashur banibal. Umalko du athrod ashur. Umur yathu. Kid mufkitu israelie umnakia. Ida. Devaitu kito gaure brinyo bisho, doen dairoye ahnone haurone, au men doe bu athro kule. Ida tshemaitu, au devaitu, msakune, talune, umantayune, lnakia. Nakia meant what she wrote, and people in Assyria knew it. But that didn't mean everybody obeyed her. Ashurbanibal's older brother, Shamashmetu Ubalit, did not accept his grandmother's treaty. He was Isarhaddon's second oldest living son, and therefore should have been the rightful ruler next to Shamashum Uki. Nakia did not care that Shamashmetu Ubalit was her grandson. She probably gave him a chance to rethink, but since he kept his hostility open against Ashurbanibal, Nakia had him killed. That set an example of what Nakia would do to anyone opposing Ashurbanibal as their king. And when it was time for his ascension, nobody dared to raise a finger. Ashurbanibal ascended the throne of Assyria and became the most powerful man in the world at the age of 16. A few months later, Shamashum Ukin was crowned king of Babylon. And everything seemed to go as Esarhaddon and Nakia had planned. That is, until the problems in Egypt started. Upon becoming king, Ashurbanibal had to deal with tremendous amounts of administration. Officials throughout his empire wrote letters to him, which he had to read and respond to, such as this one. <laughs> بطر حاجة برو دملك وأسر حدون تدعو له قرأوا لبحون بيجان ثودي لونه يتصنهرو ما عدا وازولو ترميسو مقدومه ده وملكوا شربانيمال ومريدي كوبه. 
While Ashurbanipal was busy setting up office in his capital, the Egyptian pharaoh Taharqa saw his chance to break free from Assyrian rule. He led troops that crushed the Assyrian garrison stationed at the city of Memphis, and the news reached Ashurbanipal. Taharqa had more than 20 years of experience with the Assyrians. Although he lost the last war against Esarhaddon, he had been victorious in another a few years back. Taharqa's move to regain independence from Assyria, as Ashurbanipal was trying to fit the crown to his head, was smart. And he may even have succeeded had it not been for Ashurbanipal's understanding of warfare. Ashurbanipal dispatched an army to retake Egypt and called upon his allies in the Levant. Even Cyprus sent troops and equipment, including ships, to the Assyrian cause. Ashurbanipal's troops and allies won a battle in the city of Karbanitu. Taharqa fled south, and the Assyrians regained control over Egypt. Taharqa died in exile a few years later, but his rage against the Assyrians was inherited by his son, Tanatamun. The new pharaoh followed his father's footsteps and revolted against the Assyrians. When Ashurbanipal heard of it, he dispatched troops again. Tanatamun fled south, as his father had done, and remained there until his death. After the recurring revolts in Egypt, Ashurbanipal installed Psamtik as the pharaoh. Psamtik had spent time in the Assyrian court under Esarhaddon. Thus, Ashurbanipal knew him well and equipped him with Assyrian garrisons before he had his main troops returned home. But Ashurbanipal underestimated Psamtik's ambitions. The Egyptian pharaoh would not remain a puppet ruler for long. At the age of 20, Ashurbanipal had regained control over Egypt. And with more time over, he set out to make his biggest vision come true. A library that held the world's knowledge in Nineveh. The idea may have come from Ashurbanipal's early years as a priest student. Another possible inspiration was his teacher, Balasi. Ashurbanipal looked up to Balasi even after becoming king. And although the king was one of Assyria's greatest scribes, he still revered and respected his mentor, as this letter from Balasi to Ashurbanipal reveals. <laughs> ومريدي دكتور لي أعلى حربية كي تحضلو حطوتي نديلو نيتو أعدو قد مش هدرنا ولا لملكو كلوزم أملكو حربية شيما إسبو عسخويد مترجمو إن قد ثين رسو ملكو ومريدي قد محوينو إيوثو أيدر بويو كثوتو بشرورو وحدلكو ذعب من شكل فخرويو عسخويو تفهملا one can imagine Ashurbanipal and Balasi having countless discussions over such matters. Ashurbanipal was obsessed with knowledge, and he was convinced that if he could make the dream of his library come true, the whole world would lay at his feet. The problem with his quest was that most tablets he wanted were in southern Mesopotamia, far from Nineveh, and people in the south were not as fond of the Assyrian king as in the north. But nevertheless, Ashurbanipal sent his scribes there and gave them a fortune to spend on acquiring the tablets that he wanted to own. When the people of Babylon heard how much Ashurbanipal would spend on his library, a huge crowd gathered in excitement. But Ashurbanipal wasn't just going to buy anything inscribed on clay. He clearly informed his scribes about what tablets he was looking for, as this letter from Ashurbanipal to his scribe Shudunu reveals. Min dlozim l'beth arche, u min dhoe, lo hattino, t'kitne idhi'ad leyt mneye bu athrod asho, kracha aleye u mantailine, u'udo k'thuli lo khodu mo doha iklo u lo izgado, lo beyto d'obrat, nosho lo kovet tole lo hattino menuch, ida. تحوزت لو حطينو دلوكثو لي لو خعلي تكذعت دهوه ما وثرونو لبث أرخي مدهاوستو مشاظر ليو Whenever the scribes came home with new tablets, 
Ashurbanipal had them copied onto fresh clay. All scribes Ashurbanipal employed in his library were calligraphers of the highest quality. They hardly ever made mistakes, but if they did, there was no way to hide it. Ashurbanipal could read and write as good, if not better, than his best scribes. And he made sure to read the tablets in his library and even had his signature inscribed. The king himself also composed many works written in his own hand. As his scribes collected more tablets, Ashurbanipal started organizing his library. He categorized the literature into divination, religious, lexical, medical, magical, ritual, mythological, mathematical, scientifical, historical, laws, and other tablets. But his sense of perfectionism didn't end there. Ashurbanipal made sure each tablet in a compilation carried a library tag or colophon, detailing its running number, the name of the series as a whole, and the first line of the next tablet to come. Ashurbanipal was more proud of his library and his knowledge than anything else. Whenever Ashurbanipal was depicted on reliefs, he ensured his engravers presented him with a stylus tucked into his belt, a type of pen used for inscribing cuneiform. It didn't matter if he was hunting lions, riding and firing arrows, or doing other activities. He wanted to show that the pen was part of him, and that he was a warrior and scholar. Perhaps not wanting to be away from his library for months is one reason we don't find any record of Ashurbanipal going to war with his army. Or maybe he was smart enough to realize there were better generals than him to lead his army. Ashurbanipal spent much time in his squared library in the southwest palace in Nineveh. It could have looked similar to a library today, with the clay tablets placed on their edge in niches, covering the entire walls from top to bottom. The fact that there even was a toilet in connection with the library says a great deal about the countless hours the king spent there, studying, reading and expanding his knowledge. Being the king of Assyria not only meant the power to construct libraries, the role also came with serious responsibilities. The most obvious was to maintain control over an empire that stretched from the Persian Gulf up to Anatolia, the Levant and Egypt. Through Phoenician networks, the Assyrians traded as far west as Cadiz in modern-day Spain, where olive oil and wine were important. Ashurbanipal organized his empire into provinces, each supervised by a governor appointed by the king. Every province, except the ones that protected Assyria's borders, paid taxes to Nineveh. Ashurbanipal's governors made up a group of high state officials commonly referred to as the Great Ones. The seven most senior were 1. Supreme Commander of the Assyrian Army and Commander of the Western Army. 2. Commander of the Royal Army. 3. Commander of the Northern Army. 4. Commander of the Northeastern Army. 5. Chief Judge. 6. State Treasurer. 7. Grand Vizier. Ashurbanipal issued golden signet rings bearing copies of the imperial seal to all high officials. 
Documents sealed with these rings carried royal authority and had to be obeyed. For this to work, however, the king had to rely on the judgment of his high officials. And that's why many of Ashurbanipal's high officials were eunuchs, men who agreed to adopt new names and renounce all family ties to show their loyalty to the king. Since eunuchs couldn't father children, they were less likely to want to pass on power and betray the king. But while Ashurbanipal's organized empire seemed waterproof on paper, the reality was different. Assyria was not protected by mountain ranges or the sea. It lay in an open flat landscape that until this day is a war zone. And that was one of the reasons Ashurbanipal invested heavily in his army. If the enemies of Assyria, who were present in every direction of the empire, discovered that the empire was weak, they would take the chance and strike. After a decade of peace with the Elamites, that's exactly what happened. Although the Elamite king Urtak and Ashurbanibal's father were friends and even exchanged children to be raised in each other's courts, Urtak attacked Babylonian territories in 664 BC. Ashurbanibal was not the ruler of Babylonia. His brother Shamashum Ukin was. But the overall military security of the kingdom, including its East Tigris regions, was controlled by Ashurbanipal. The reason was likely that Ashurbanipal never trusted his brother enough to give him military resources that could be used against him. Ashurbanipal sent his troops south and the Assyrians repelled the Elamite invasion. King Urtak died the same year and his brother, Teoman, took the throne unrightfully instead of Urtak's son, Umanigash. Fearing for his life, Umanigash fled to Nineveh with his two younger brothers and dozens of members of his wider royal family. Ashurbanipal granted them all security, something that enraged Teoman. The new Elamite king demanded that Ashurbanipal hand them over, but Ashurbanipal refused. The Assyrian king knew that knowledge was power, and having indigenous Elamites by his side could be useful. The years went by, and while Ashurbanipal put down rebellions in the Levant, as well as Anatolia and Urartu, Egypt was slowly slipping from his hands. The puppet ruler Psamtik had grown in confidence, and while Psamtik still had great respect for Ashurbanipal, he wanted full control of Egypt. He tried to reach his goal peacefully, not to enrage Ashurbanipal, while also making new allies in case the Assyrian king would retaliate. But somehow, the relationship between Egypt and Assyria remained friendly, and decades later, Psamtik would send troops to help Ashurbanipal's son. But for the time being, Ashurbanipal had to let go of Egypt. He was faced with a much greater threat in the east, again. The Elamite king, Teoman, had spent the years following his ascent to the throne planning how to exterminate Assyria. The tension between Teoman and Ashurbanipal, and Teoman and anything that was Assyrian, grew larger than ever. It probably had little to do with the fact that Ashurbanipal held the true king of Elam, Umanigash, in his court at Nineveh, and more to do with Teoman's anti-Assyrian politics. In 653 BC, Teoman felt confident enough to attack Ashurbanipal's empire in the hopes of bringing it down. But the Elamite king had greatly underestimated the Assyrian army, or overestimated that of his own, because his attack was repelled by the Assyrians, who by the orders of Ashurbanipal went after the Elamites. At Til Tuba, by the river of Ulai, both armies clashed in a brutal fight that changed the color of Ulai. The Assyrian army launched a full-scale attack. The Elamites resisted desperately, but the Assyrian forces swiftly penetrated their battle lines. This advance forced the Elamites into a chaotic retreat. In their panic, they fled down a hill, with the relentless Assyrians closing in on them. The Elamites' flight was halted at the banks of the Ulai River, where they faced a grim choice. Fight 
backward jump. The Assyrians, however, gave them little chance, cutting down many and hurling the rest into the river. Amidst this turmoil, the Elamite king Toman and his son Tamaritu were thrown from their chariot in their attempt to escape. Though both quickly rose, Tamaritu's second bid for freedom was cut short when an arrow struck his father. The Assyrians closed in swiftly, surrounding them, and in a final act of defiance, Tamaritu drew his bow, but an Assyrian soldier struck him down with a decisive blow from a mace. To seal the victory over Elam, another Assyrian soldier cut off Teoman's head and carried it as a trophy all the way to Nineveh for Ashurbanibal. The Assyrian king, who was 32 years old at the time, was proud of this victory. He had Teoman's head hooked to a tree in his garden and celebrated with his wife, Libali Shara. The royal couple feasted on the finest food in the shade under grapevines, accompanied by musicians and servants. This banquet scene also illustrates the cover of Table of Gods, my upcoming cookbook inspired by the world's oldest recipes written on clay tablets in ancient Mesopotamia 4,000 years ago. But more than a cookbook, Table of Gods is a time machine in the size of a coffee table book, aiming to transport readers back to the cradle of civilization through all senses. Each chapter of the book begins with a travel guide to a Mesopotamian city and then presents recipes from that very city adapted for the modern kitchen. If you've ever wanted to dine like Ashurbanibal or walk the streets of Nineveh, Ashur or Babylon, it will soon be possible. If you join the waiting list at tableofgods.com yt, you'll receive three ancient recipes and one monthly email detailing my progress, including my journeys to the cradle of civilization, where I've traveled several times over the past years to immerse myself in its rich history and culinary traditions. With Teoman dead, his nephews Umanigash and Tamaritu could return home to Elam. Ashurbanibal had protected the brothers from Teoman for a decade and placed a lot of trust in them. He installed Umanigash as king over Madaktu and Tamaritu over Hidalu. Both were Elamite cities, and the brothers sworn loyalty to the Assyrian king. With Elam finally subdued, Ashurbanibal could catch his breath. It was a brief respite, however, since his father's worst nightmare came true. Shamashum Ukin had been the king of Babylon for 16 years. While his father planned that he and Ashurbanibal would be equals, nothing could have been further from the truth. Shamashum Ukin barely managed an army to protect his city, and he regularly had to put up with his younger brother interfering in Babylonian affairs. Such as when Ashurbanibal built Babylon's most important temple, the Esagila, and the great ziggurat, the Temenanki works that should have been carried out by the king of Babylon. Although Shamashum Ukin never got over his father's decision to place Ashurbanibal on the Assyrian throne, he must have accepted it, based on 16 years of peace. But when Shamashum Ukin didn't even get to act as the king of tiny Babylon, he couldn't take it anymore. Shamashum Ukin, who was ethnically Assyrian, had immersed himself in Babylonian culture. He assimilated well and attended rituals and festivals as any native Babylonian king would. His support in southern Mesopotamia was unquestionable, but Shamashumukin knew that local support wasn't enough to break free from Assyrian rule. So he began assembling allies he knew despised Assyria, and there were lots of them. The news reached Ashurbanibal. And if Ashurbanibal tried to talk sense directly to his brother to stop the revolt, is not recorded. But maybe Shamashamukin had enough of his young brother bossing him around, in which case it wouldn't matter. Ashurbanibal must have felt deep feelings of betrayal. Shamashamukin was, after all, Ashurbanibal's favorite brother, and one he had spent a lot of time growing up with. In a last attempt to avoid a revolt, Ashurbanibal wrote a letter addressed to the people of Babylon. 
شامعنو أدقلد أحوني مر للخو أحونو دلتيو شاريرو شامعنو كل ما يدد مر له هاني كل دقلينه لو متيقنيتو له كيومينو بآشو رماردوك أنالو هايذي أونو لم حاططلي ميدة ملابي ولو نافق خبرو مريمونو مفامي خدو ميدة هو دمر لأعلي إذا لم لا ودخو روحيخو أعمى برن ييذي تراوت حزينو فونويو لي إيقرثيذي بارويو Ashurbanibal's attempt to stop the rebellion was in vain. The people of Babylonia supported Shamashum Ukin, and so did Umanigash, the Elamite king that Ashurbanibal protected for a decade and installed on the throne of Elam. This was the second time Ashurbanibal had been betrayed by a king he had established, the first being the Egyptian pharaoh, Psamtik. But no betrayal could have hurt as much as that coming from his own brother. Bayaumani Shama Shumukin Uahunaydi Dlatyo Shariro Dawino Le Moro Usimli Malkul Bobel Umeded La Zimle Limalkuthede Simli Uhulile Fulhe Sisye Merkapyotho Mahatli Bidothe مذينوثو حقلي قانوثو عم عموري تحيانو طامو هو لي لازد ترمو ميدد بابي دمرلي بس طاعي يطوثو دمحو لي لي إيلو هو محاطط لي بيشوثو According to a later legend Ashurbanibal and Shamashum Ukin's sister, Sherua Eterat, attempted to intervene and stop her brothers from fighting. While that may be true, it didn't help. The sibling's mother, Eshara Hamat, couldn't do anything either, since she had passed away long before. If the brother's grandmother, Nakia, was alive at the time, is not certain. But if she was, she would likely have supported her favorite grandson. Ashurbanibal. There was nothing that could prevent the war between Ashurbanibal and Shamashum Ukin, except for divine intervention. On the 17th of July, 652 BC, Ashurbanibal asked his diviners if he would be favored in an attack against his brother. After the diviners performed the ritual, they told Ashurbanibal that even if Assyrian troops were to enter Babylon, they would not capture his rebellious brother, Shamashum Ukin. In normal cases, that should have been enough to stop Ashurbanibal. But the Assyrian king deliberately disregarded the oracle's words and dispatched his troops to Babylonia. By late 652 BC, the brothers were at war. During the first two years, they fought all over Babylonia, from cities in the north to the sealand in the south. Some victories went to Ashurbanibal, others to Shamashum Ukin. Key cities changed hands, and there was a considerable amount of chaos. It was difficult for both sides to keep track of their allies and enemies, especially when major players secretly changed sides and disclosing state secrets to the enemy. One of them was Nabu Bel Shumati, a man whose betrayal enraged Ashurbanibal to the point that the Assyrian king would never cease searching for him. Despite military support from foreign rulers, Shama Shumukin was losing ground. Ashurbanibal took control of the south and by mid-650 BC he laid siege to Babylon. He cut off their access to food and water as well as military aid. During the following two years of the Assyrian blockade, the Babylonians suffered from thirst, hunger, and disease. Documents from Babylon support Ashurbanibal's grim descriptions of the misery. <laughs> مكفن رغلو ثي ودرعوني ناشيفي 
يفوتوا دبرنوا شكايم ومغامة ومحاشة شتقن كاسيلة إنفيتو وما الكيذا موتوا تشتقوا بيزا علي During the same period, Shama Shamukin wrote down his feelings of despair being captured in his own city. After two years inside the city walls, the Babylonians opened the gates. It could have been by orders of Shama Shamukin who saw it as the only way to save his people. But it could also have been that the inhabitants themselves finally took that decision. In any case, Ashurbanibal would not spare his brother, nor the Babylonians who supported him. ومحاطتها بيشوثه مقابل ديني قطع لي لشونية وكب لي ريشية أعوم ورحرينة تكتفن عايشة سهايك لي بيدوك تسمي مورو دوثو مقابل صنحاري بأبابو دبابي نحري لي بدوك ثي خط قربون ولطلو لي ذي When the Assyrians entered Babylon they burned the city Ashurbanibal wrote about that too, and the fate of his brother. From Ashurbanibal's inscription, it seems that Shama Shumukin threw himself into the fire to avoid being captured by his brother. Shama Shumukin's prized possessions, his crown, scepter, and seal, were plundered from his palace and paraded with other spoils of war before Ashurbanibal. Ashurbanibal appointed loyal officials and the new king, Kandalanu, to rule over Babylonia. And after having seen what happened to Ashurbanibal's brother, they remained loyal. The civil war against Babylon took its toll on 37-year-old Ashurbanibal. Deep down, the Assyrian king must have felt that it could have been avoided and that he could have acted differently to keep better relations with his brother. On one hand, Ashurbanibal failed his father for not being equal to his brother and therefore causing Shamashum Ukin to revolt. On the other hand, Shamashum Ukin may have planned the revolt ever since he became the king of Babylon. In any case, causing the death of a favorite brother must have been a tragic moment in Ashurbanibal's life, regardless of his cruel and cold inscriptions about it. But whenever the king needed to shift focus, he turned to an activity he had enjoyed since childhood, lion hunting. The adrenaline felt from the roaring lions within arm's reach forced the king to clear his mind, to stay focused and be present, or else he could suffer severely. Ashurbanibal used to hunt lions in the wild. He would travel by boat or on horseback to the countryside around Nineveh. There was an abundance of lions there which was confirmed by archaeologist Henry Layard 2,500 years later. But the lion hunt also occurred in a more controlled environment in the capital. In the northeastern part of Nineveh, there was a large arena resembling the Roman Colosseum. Here, in front of big crowds, hungry lions would be released against Ashurbanibal and his bodyguards. But contrary to the Romans, this wasn't simply entertainment, although people would try to get the best seats during the event. For the Assyrians, this tradition held a deep purpose. The king showed his people that by killing the lions, he could protect them from evil. And for Ashurbanibal, who never went on war campaigns, 
The lion hunt was his chance to show his physical abilities. If the king was ever in real danger, is questionable. He must have been when hunting lions in the wild. But in the arena, the lion hunt was highly organized, and the king usually rode on a chariot. That made it harder for the lions to get to him. But that didn't mean they didn't try. Despite being an organized event, hunting lions with bow and sword came with risks. If Ashurbanipal had a bad day and missed his target, he had to rely on his bodyguards. And with more than one lion unleashed at the time, there was always a possibility of something going wrong, which the fear in the eyes of Ashurbanipal's horses clearly tells. But despite lion's sharp teeth, claws, and rage, the real danger for Ashurbanipal was elsewhere. The year following the death of Shamashum Ukin, Ashurbanipal wrote a letter to the elders of Elam. The Assyrian king had still not forgotten about Nebu Belshumati, the official who betrayed him in the Babylonian war. Ashurbanipal warned the Elamites that failure to hand over Nebu Belshumati would result in the complete destruction of their land. But the new Elamite king, Umanaldash, refused. The reason might have been that he wanted the Assyrians to invade so he could in turn punish them, or that he simply didn't believe Ashurbanipal would send his whole army just to capture one person. But Ashurbanipal meant every single word. He sent his troops to Hamanu and captured the city easily, forcing Umanaldash to flee into the mountains. But Ashurbanipal wasn't done. After 20 years of continuous rebellion and betrayal, he had grown tired of Elam. So he marched on Susa, Elam's most revered city. <laughs> From that day on, Elam was never a problem again for the Assyrians. But Ashurbanipal wasn't satisfied yet. So he wrote again to Umanaldash asking, or rather demanding, that he hand over Nabu Belshumati. The letter seemed to have reached all the way to Nabu Belshumati himself. After the death of Nebu Belshumati, a group of Assyrian soldiers tracked down Umanaldash, who was hiding in the mountains. They took him to Nineveh and Ashurbanipal, who let him live with one requirement. He would serve the Assyrian king until the end of his days. He was made to carry the king's food at festive banquets and pull his chariot like a horse during New Year's festivals. Ashurbanipal was now in his 40s. And while that is considered middle age today, 40 was a ripe old age for an Assyrian king. With Babylonia and Elam dealt with, Ashurbanipal turned his attention to his capital, Nineveh. The king built a new palace, the North Palace, which he decorated with wall panels, showing off his victorious battle campaigns and lion hunts. Ashurbanipal also built another library in his new palace and started collecting new tablets. 
Although his age made it harder for him to hunt lions, reading and writing were a passion he continued to pursue. But Ashurbanipal's last years went silent. The king became absent and was likely suffering from depression, just like his father. Ashurbanipal's inscriptions used to flow with energy, confidence, and power. But in one of his last journals, we get closer to his emotions than ever before. And his words tell us of a man that had been through much in his life and had little left to live for. The last decade of Ashurbanipal's reign is a vacuum in history. And at the age of 54, Ashurbanipal died. His wife, Libali Sharat, lived for a few more years and the couple's oldest son, Ashur Etel Ilani, took over the throne. But after he died, only four years later, Ashurbanipal's second oldest son, Sinshar Ishkun, became king. But none of them could ever fill their father's shoes, and the vast Assyrian Empire fell less than 20 years after Ashurbanipal's death. When the Medes and Babylonians broke the walls of Nineveh in 612 BC, they destroyed the city to the ground. They defaced Ashurbanipal's head on wall reliefs in his palace and burned his library. The aggressive fire baked the clay tablets and ironically helped preserve them for Henry Layard, who excavated Ashurbanipal's library 2,500 years later. Ashurbanipal's reign brought the neo Assyrian Empire to its zenith, stretching its influence far and wide. But his most enduring legacy and greatest conquest was always in this humble room in Nineveh. With more than 30,000 clay tablets, Ashurbanipal's library was one of the most outstanding achievements any king ever accomplished. In his quest for wisdom, Ashurbanipal unknowingly built a bridge between his world and the modern world we live in today. Hadn't it been for his library, much of what we know about ancient Mesopotamia today would be a black hole. Among the most known works he collected and copied are the Babylonian creation epic Enuma Elish, the myth of Adapa, the poor man of Nippur, and the epic of Gilgamesh. Ashurbanipal's personality was a paradox. He slayed lions, killed his brother, and hung beheaded enemy heads on trees in his garden. He grew up amidst family tragedies, lived in constant war, and was betrayed many times. On the one hand, his life was marked by brutal and ruthless actions, reflecting the harsh realities of his time and the demands of his role as king of Assyria. Yet, there was something humble in his love for literature, something genuine in his relationship with his childhood mentor, Balasi, and something admirable in his dedication to building a library of 30,000 clay tablets, not only for his own use, but for future generations. <laughs>